everyone, welcome to another tech tip here at 45 Drives. So today I'm gonna to be talking about encryption at rest via software. And I really have a lot to say on this topic, so let's just dive in. All right, so we released a great video talking about encryption at rest via SEDs or self-encrypting drives a while ago. And in that, Brett discussed some really, really cool things there. So to be sure to definitely check that out. But in this video, we're gonna take a look at one of the main ways encryption at rest can be achieved with software rather than hardware. In Linux, using dmcrypt via Lux. So we're gonna dive into how it works, also how it compares to self-encrypting drives. And I'm also gonna to touch on how easy it is to make use of dmcrypt in Ceph for your OSDs. Once I talk through all those things, I also prepared a little demo showing off how to use dmcrypt in Linux and how to put together a really cool way to help visualize the difference between an encrypted disk and an unencrypted disk using a hex dump tool where I'm gonna actually be able to go underneath the disk and pull readable data from one disk but not from the other one. So now that you know what you're in for for this video, let's uh, jump into it. All right, so what is dmcrypt? Well, dmcrypt is a Linux kernel level encryption system. It provides a transparent encryption to your disks, your LVs, or even a file-based block device that you create. It's widely used and very mature that has been used for over a decade in the Linux kernel. So let's talk about what dmcrypt does. Well, essentially, dmcrypt takes your data, encrypts it on the fly as it's written to the disk. When you read the data from the disk, dmcrypt decrypts it in real time as well. So you don't have to worry about manually encrypting or decrypting your data every time you wanna access it. So one of the main benefits of dmcrypt is that it's highly configurable. You can choose the encryption algorithm, the key size, the type, as well as many other parameters that fit your specific needs. Additionally, dmcrypt supports various authentication mechanisms like passphrases, key files, and even TPMs to ensure that only authorized users can access your data. All right, so how does dmcrypt compare to self-encrypting drives then? Well, self-encrypting drives, or SEDs, are hardware-based solutions that encrypt data at the drive level. Like Brett explains in his video, SEDs use specialized hardware to encrypt and decrypt data, which can provide past faster performance than software-based solutions, like dmcrypt. However, SEDs are typically more expensive than software-based solutions, of course, and they may not be as configurable as something like dmcrypt. And I'm gonna insert my own opinion here, but they can be much more of a pain in the ass. Uh, so, are there any trade-offs though when it comes to using something like dmcrypt versus a hardware-based solution? Well, the first one would certainly potentially be performance, right? But it may not be as bad as you think. So, first, it's important to note that encryption and decryption are computationally, computationally expensive. Uh, and so, in order to do that with software-based encryption, it can potentially impact the performance of your system. However, modern CPUs have quite significantly improved this in recent years, and modern processors come with hardware-level encryption support that can significantly improve the performance of software-based encryption. So, for example, Intel processors, I think ever since the Skylake generation onwards, feature Intel Advanced Encryption Standards uh, instruction sets, which are a set of instructions that accelerate AES encryption and decryption in hardware. Similarly, AMD does this as well with their Ryzen generation onwards featuring AMD Secure Processor. This includes also the hardware level AES encryption support. All right, so these hardware level encryption features can significantly improve the performance of software-based encryption with dmcrypt when using AES. So in fact, in many cases, the performance impact of using dmcrypt is pretty much negligible when using modern CPUs in hardware with hardware level encryption support. But you gotta keep in mind that this specific performance impact is gonna depend on a lot of different factors, right? Including the CPU model itself, the encryption algorithm, the key size used, the amount of data being encrypted, and the workload specifically. So in general though, if you're using a modern CPU with hard lo hardware level encryption support, the performance impact of using dmcrypt should be pretty minimal. Um, but you gotta note, right, that there are gonna be some scenarios where performance impact of dmcrypt may be more significant. So for example, if you're running a workload that involves a lot of small frequent writes, like a database or a log file, the overhead of, overhead of encryption and decryption may be quite a bit more noticeable in those cases. So you might wanna consider using hardware-based encryption solutions or optimizing your, your system to minimize the performance impact of, of this type of encryption. Now, before we hop into the demo, I'm just gonna point out that if you're gonna be running ZFS and are interested in encryption at rest, 
ZFS does have native encryption built in. Big surprise there, right? ZFS is like the teacher's pet of file systems. It does parity, it does mirroring, it does striping, it does volume managing. It has its own file system, has its own cache separate from the OS page cache, and of course, it has its own encryption standard. So that being said though, if you are in need of encryption at rest for your Ceph cluster, I do have good news there as well. It is extremely trivial to create encrypted OSDs in Ceph. So when you create your Ceph OSD with Ceph Volume LVM, you simply need to pass the DMCrypt flag and Ceph will actually handle the rest. The keys needed to lock and unlock the DMCrypt LV are then passed to the Ceph monitors where they're stored and called on when starting and stopping the OSD. All right, so with all that out of the way, let's hop into the demo I have prepared. All right, welcome to the DMCrypt demo. Um, let's jump right into it. So in this demo, we're gonna go through the process of creating an encrypted block device using DMCrypt. I'm gonna to attempt to help everyone understand how all the different pieces kind of come together and to give you those DMCrypt encrypted volumes. Now, there's a lot of pieces working, uh, moving pieces to this, so I wanna to try to make it as concise as possible and easy to understand. So let's start by explaining what the pieces that we're working with here. So we have Device Mapper, and what Device Mapper is, is a framework provided by the Linux kernel. So this is what gives you the ability to take your physical block devices and actually create higher level virtual block devices with them. Uh, and that is important for DMCrypt. And actually DMCrypt is a target that's used uh, for device mapper. So DMCrypt takes device mapper and it provides transparent encryption. So it allows us to create our virtual block device with DMCrypt and device mapper and have all the data that's encrypted on the fly as well as oh, before it gets committed to disk. So it's encrypted on the fly, then it's committed to the disk in an encrypted uh, format. And then when it's going out to be read to the user, it's decrypted on the fly in the same way for reads. So Lux is another part of this equation. Uh, and what Lux really is, is just a unified key setup. So it's a, it's a standard standard that we use to make uh, key management much more efficient and user friendly. Uh, without Lux, DMCrypt would be a bit more cumbersome and error prone, so we're going to stick with using Lux for our formatting uh, in this case. So the demo itself, we're going to be using Rocky Linux. Uh, so we have our version right here, we're on 8.7, not quite up to date, but uh, this is the version we're running with. This will work at any uh, modern uh, Linux environment, and even not so modern. Um, so in order to follow along, you're going to need to install Crypt Setup. So obviously you have to have Device Mapper as well, but uh, Crypt Setup is, is what you're going to want to install. So in this case, we would run a DNF install Crypt Setup, but I already have that installed. Next, we need some uh, a disk that we want to encrypt. So what I'm going to mention is, uh, you know, in a, in a, a real environment, I would recommend um, using, let's say, either at least partitions and if not partitions, uh, uh, LVM, LVM would be ideal, right? Um, I, I typically don't recommend if you're going to be creating uh, device mappers or, or using uh, DMCrypt, putting any partition or even putting a file system directly on the block device itself may not be ideal. Uh, just using a partition is great because it gives a little more flexibility and then LVM is the ultimate, right? You have additional flexibility uh, for whatever the future may bring, right? If you put this on an LV, you may be able to expand the LV underneath over time and, and if you ever needed to grow it and things like that. So there's so many considerations that may, uh, you may be thanking yourself down the line to be using LVM or a partition. But for this case, we're just gonna be putting it right on the right on the block device just to make it easy for, for a demo. Um, so we have two commands here, and we can see uh, one of them is slightly different, and, and one of them has a key file, and one of them does not. So really what this comes down to is uh, the first command, if we were to run this and create a DMCrypt volume, it would give, ask us for a key, uh, passphrase. And that passphrase would then be what you would enter to, in, uh, to open and close the volume. Um, or you could have it point to a key file and then when you want to open the volume you just point to that file and, and it would do the same thing. So key file is kind of a misnomer because when we're thinking of key uh, in this case usually we're talking about the actual master key but really you can think of it as another passphrase somewhere where you can put your passphrase. Um, so continuing on, let's let's talk about the the different actual um, arguments to this command, and we'll just get a look at it and kind of what they are. So we're both using AES, right? The standard for the cipher. If you call from earlier in the video, I did mention modern CPUs have hardware level AES acceleration. 
So this is a good start here, right? Uh, none of the other, uh, note that a lot of the other options and, and ways to configure dmcrypt volume. So if you do want to use them in a production setting, I would say, hey, try out a few different ones and see what's best for you and do a bit of research on best for performance and things like that. So the key size here, uh, this is actually setting the size of the master key, the master encryption key that's going to be doing the encryption and decryption of your data. So the larger your, your key size, the more CPU intensive that encrypting and decrypting will be. This also means that you know if you go smaller, uh, it's, it's gonna be faster, but the larger it is, it's the better the encryption would be. Um, so again, something I would recommend uh, trying out yourself to see what's best for your needs. Uh, iteration time or iter time is, is simply the amount of time it takes to open or uh, open the, the actual encrypted volume. So this is great for like brute force attacks, right? You can increase this higher. This is set to four seconds, so these are milliseconds. So this means that, um, you know, if you were just trying password after password after password, um, you at least have to wait four seconds between each, each attempt, but you can, you can increase that or change that as needed. Next, we have our hashing algorithm. So, um, Actually, this, the, the, this next part, talking about the hash algorithm, is, is used to derive uh, the key that will actually be used to decrypt the master key. So we, we got to, uh, you know, put this all out on the table and kind of explain the pieces to the pie, so to speak. So we do have the master key that I just mentioned that actually encrypts and decrypts the, volume, uh, the, the data. But we also have the key that is used to decrypt that key. Um, and so where does that come from? Well, it comes from either the passphrase that you give it or the key file. So uh, let's, let's talk about it a little bit. So the first command you can see doesn't have that key, right? So when we run the command, you're gonna be asked for that passphrase. The passphrase is gonna be used to turn uh, into a KEK, -E <laughs> or a key encryption key. So for those of you unfamiliar with this stuff, like try, try to stay with me here and it'll definitely be confusing. Uh, be, it definitely can be confusing. So when we enter a passphrase or our key file, right? So a passphrase and a key file are essentially the same thing here. So let's, let's keep it at that. Uh, I know it can be confusing, especially because we're saying key here and key here, but they are totally different types of keys. So when we say passphrase, it's the passphrase that you're going to use to open the, the uh, encrypted volume to start using, but the key file and the key that's in that file is the exact same thing. It's like your, your passphrase that's just stored in a file. So the key file or the passphrase can then be turned into a KEK, but in order to do that, it first is salted, meaning additional characters are added to it, and then it's hashed, and that's hashed using the hash algorithm that we choose here. Uh, so we specified uh, SHA-512. So this is then the key that is used to encrypt and decrypt the master key, which then opens the volume for usage. So this master key is then what encrypts and decrypts all the data on the volume, like I mentioned already. All right, so after getting through that, uh, we go to Lux format. So we already talked about Lux format uh, in the beginning. It's just the standard that makes it a little more user friendly. And I'll kind of show that with a few commands. You can see how nice it is. And then finally, of course, we have the disk that we want to run this on. So in this lab, like I mentioned, we're going to be doing just regular disks, regular block device. And I already kind of did my, my spiel on why LV, LVM or at least partitioning may be ideal. Okay, so let's continue. So for this test, I think I'm going to use a key file just to, to keep it simple here so I don't have to enter a passphrase that you can't see me entering. Um, this might be a little more ideal if you wanted to decrypt on boot, but there are other ways to deal with that as well with a passphrase. The safest way might be using a TPM or something like that. So instead of calling a key file, um, using a TPM. All right. So that being said, let, let's get started on this and let's, uh, let's run this command. So first thing we want to do is we want to actually build an encrypted volume on our disk. So let's go crypt, set up, verbose. Okay, key size, we're gonna go 512. Iter time equals 4,000. I'll actually show this off. We can see this in real time as well, the, the iteration time. Um, hash, let's go SHA-512 like we mentioned. So this case, I've already created a key file. It's in pw.txt. I'll show that off in a second, but let's go key file equals pw.txt. And again, we're gonna use our Lux format and we're gonna give it our SDC disk. So we can see it's gonna tell us it's gonna overwrite all of our data irre irrevocably, of course. So in capital letters, we're gonna say, yes, we are sure. 
So this is going to take a little time uh, while it actually generates that cipher. Okay, and so there we go. So what that did was it went through and it took my key file and it salted that and it hashed it and it created a new key out of that file. Then it took that key and it created the actual master encryption key. So let's now take a look here. Uh, so we have that created, but if we do a list of block device, SDC does not look any different. Uh, and that's because we have not activated or opened, opened the actual uh, dmcrypt volume. So let's, let's take a look here. Let's open it up. First we'll go time, because we wanna see how long it takes, right? Because we set the iteration time to, to four seconds. So let's try that. So let's go time, crypt setup. Open, type lux, um, dev, and we chose SDC, and we'll point to our key file again. All right. Oh, my mistake. Actually, we have to give it a name as well, of course. So what do we want to call this? Well, uh, I think let's call it crypt demo. It's a good name. That's the actual uh, device mapper name that we're going to give it. So we're saying, hey, we want to open this volume, but we will, we have to give it a actual device mapper name. So let's call it Crypt Demo. And there we go. So it's going to take a couple seconds here. And then there we go. We can see just about four seconds there uh, for real time, which is just our iteration time that we selected. So now if we do LS block, we can see now we've got a device, a partition off of our SDC device, which is exactly what we were wanting to see. So let's take a look at the status. So crypt setup, dash V status, crypt demo. So we can see clearly that this is a Lux2 uh, DM crypt volume. We set our cipher, our key size that we know. And also we can see the device uh, that it's tied to. So exactly um, what we'd expected to see here. Let's go a little further and let's do a Lux dump and get a look at uh, underneath here. So set up again, so Lux dump and SDC as well. All right, so this one's a little more verbose, but let's see what it's telling us. We have our Lux header information. Again, we're using Lux2. Uh, we see uh, information, we got the UUID of the device. But first, let's see, we have our key slot. So this is our master key right here. This is the information about our actual master key. We can see it's 512 bits. We can see it's using the AES cipher. Um, we can also see down here the salt. Um, and also if you see the AF hash is SHA-512. Now if you remember, we also have our other key, which is our uh, KEK or key encryption key. But what it's actually called, you can see here, it's, it's password based key derivation function because the key here is derived from the actual passphrase or the key that we gave it. So this is that right there, and this is used to decrypt this guy here. So very, very cool stuff. Now, with that being said, let's put a file system on this disk or on this uh, DMCrypt volume, and let's put some data on it. And what I'm gonna show is we're gonna put some data on an encrypted volume and an unencrypted volume, and then we'll use a tool like strings to actually be able to pull real data off the unencrypted volume, even though it's not mounted, whereas uh, we'll never be able to do that on an actual encrypted volume. So let's start with that. So let's make a fess um, on our new dev mapper crypt demo. So there we go. And let's do the same thing on just a regular disk. Okay, so we now have two file systems. Let's make a directory to mount them. So let's maybe call one unencrypted and we'll call the other one encrypted. So first let's mount uh, crypt demo over at encrypted. And let's mount dev, just a regular disk at unencrypted. Okay, so if we take a look at our file systems here, we can see we've got both of those mounted. So first things first, let's uh, head on into our encrypted volume. I'm actually just gonna copy paste this command because it's long. So essentially what I'm doing here is I'm just echoing, I'm putting some data into a file. So we can see I'm echoing, this is a file with super important secret data and I'm putting it into secret.txt and then I'm just making sure it syncs and I'm dropping cache because I want to make sure that the data is fully committed to disk before I uh, unmount it because it needs to be actually on the disk. So that's what we're gonna do. 
So we just did that, and now we can even cat secret.txt, and there you go. So the, the text is there, the file is there. So let's go into our unencrypted volume, and let's do the exact same thing. Let's create a file and do the exact same steps. So in this file system, we can also cat secret, and we can see it there. So beautiful. So next, uh, let me clear that out. So let me go back into root, and let's unmount both of these volumes. So let's mount, unmount unencrypted, and let's unmount encrypted. All right, so we don't have the file system mounted anymore, but our disks, of course, are still there. We can see the crypt demo is still unlocked. Uh, so first things first, let's lock that guy back up. So let's go crypt, setup, close, and just the name that we gave it. You don't have to give it the whole path. So let's close crypt demo. So now if we list our block devices again, we're going to see it's gone now. We can't see it under STC anymore. Beautiful. All right. So now let's try to visualize this. So now we have two disks here. One is encrypted, one is not. Let's use the strings tool to actually try to read through the actual raw block device and see if we can pull any data off of either raw block device. So let's go strings dev sdd, which is our unencrypted volume. And let's grep for secret. So let's try to search for the string secret on the raw block device. Look at that. We now have been able to, we've been able to pull off um, those strings with the word secret in it. So we can see that all of the data that's lying on that underlying block device is absolutely sitting there in, in text, plain text being able to be pulled by a hex dump tool or even you know any, any tool would be able to pull that data directly off of because it's fully unencrypted, right? We understand that. But let's try that same exact thing on our encrypted disk. And I already know what's going to happen, but let's, let's try it anyway. So we'll sit here. Um, now this will just sit here and it will try to run through the entire disk. And let's just let it. And there we go. It didn't return anything. But let's go a little further. Let's actually do it without any grep so we can kind of get a look at just how different an encrypted disk uh, raw and an unencrypted disk raw looks like. So let's go strings dev. So this again is the unencrypted disk. So let's take a look. And that looks very easy to read, right? Um, not very anything uh, uh, very exciting going on there, right? It's just pulling all that out off of the blocks. Okay, so let's try that again, but let's do it with the encrypted volume. Let's take a look at how different this is going to be. All right, so let's stop it right there. Quite a bit different, right? We can see all very random. So that is essentially the way uh, I tried to come up with the best way to try to visualize it. I thought a little bit about maybe taking uh, both block devices and, and exporting them as PNGs and showing the random distribution. But I thought that would be a, at least a cool way to kind of show this off, how, how very, very different under, underneath uh, these devices are now because of one being just a standard file system and one having that DMcrypt device mapped on it. So, that concludes our demo here. Uh, let's head on back over to the studio and uh, we'll wrap everything up. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed that little demo using DMcrypt. Uh, hopefully you've learned something and then maybe I've even inspired a few of you to go out and try to play with DMcrypt on your own with your own volumes. Um, so if, if, you, if I did inspire any of you to do that, leave a comment down below and let us know that you tried it and what your results were. Especially if you did some performance testing, that'd be really cool as well. But with that being said, we'll see you on the next one.